Russia, October 1917. From Petrograd, a shock wave pulsed and widened through all this vast land which had once been an empire. The billows beat in every quarter of the world. Let everyone remember that in this war there are no reverses of the Russians, of the English, or of the French alone, and that success or failure is one and the same thing for all. The fervent hopes once expressed by a Russian politician, now, in the winter of 1917, struck an ominous note. In the East, a spectre more alarming than all the shapes of death itself had appeared upon the battlefield a spectre that had long haunted the war leaders' minds. For here was the most dreaded casualty of all, the will to war itself. Russia could go on no longer. Hindenburg said, Hitherto the unwieldy Russian colossus had hung over the whole European and Asiatic world like a nightmare. Time and time again, her efforts had produced considerable crises for us. Tannenberg, August 1914. The enemy losses were extremely heavy, but our high command believed themselves compelled prematurely to draw away to the east strong forces from the west, where they were trying to secure a rapid decision. Mazurian Lakes, February 1915. Mighty masses rolled up against us, overwhelming masses, each one larger than our whole force. But German resolution bore this load, and Russian blood flowed in streams. Galicia. May 1915. The fearful and continuous tension of the situation in the Carpathians and its reaction on the political situation imperiously demanded some solution. We found ourselves compelled to send large forces there to keep up our pressure upon the enemy. Gorlitze Tarnov, 1915. There was something unsatisfactory about the encounters of this year. The Russian bear had escaped our clutches, bleeding, no doubt, from more than one wound, but still not stricken to death. Would he have enough life force left to make things difficult for us again? Her casualties had been the highest of all the combatant nations. No one knows the figures. Five or eight millions. All we know is that sometimes in our battles with the Russian, we had to remove the mounds of enemy corpses from before our trenches in order to get a fresh field of fire against assaulting waves. Yet in 1916, the Russians had won a great victory over the Austrians in Galicia. The Germans and Austrians had had to stretch their manpower resources to the utmost to resist this blow. In January 1917, an Allied delegation arrived in Russia to develop efficiency for the planned offensive of that year. The British military attaché in Russia wrote, The prospects for the 1917 campaign were brighter than they'd been in 1916. The Russian infantry was tired, but less tired than it had been 12 months earlier. The stocks of arms and technical equipment were larger 
and for the first time supplies from overseas were arriving in appreciable quantities. In fact, desertions from the front ran into hundreds of thousands. Russia had lost at least as many dead as the British and French put together. She had suffered literally beyond endurance. She had reached her limit. Her soldiers, once so brave, had had enough. Now they were getting out of the trenches to fraternize with the Germans, man to man. In the rear, industrialization had been changing the face of Tsarist Russia, drawing peasants into the towns and creating a new, incoherent proletariat. The economy functioned in a welter of administrative confusion. But committees set up to organize production and supply after the appalling breakdowns of the early days of the war had begun to have some effect. By the end of 1916, great improvements had been achieved. Patriotic spirit ran high. Victory over the Germans was the simple aim of most of the population. Pressure for more efficient management of the war was exerted by liberal politicians through the elected parliament, or Duma. But Tsar Nicholas II had no use for constitutional government. At his coronation, he said, I shall maintain the principle of autocracy just as firmly and unflinchingly as it was preserved by my dead father. But Nicholas II was gentler, weaker than his father. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, wrote, He would never have been chosen by any responsible board of directors to manage any business of any magnitude, and certainly not a business confronted with a serious emergency. He was a devoted family man, deeply fond of his son, the Tsarevich, who suffered from haemophilia, a blood disease which made every scratch dangerous. There was nothing the Tsar liked better than to be with his soldiers and sailors. In 1915, he had made himself supreme commander. He loved the simple link, as he saw it, that bound him to his wider family, the 170 million people of Russia. Emotional loyalty to a paternal Tsar and the mystery of their religion were the simple guiding principles of their lives. The life of the ordinary peasant was miserable. Often they lodged in the same single room hovel with their animals on earthen floors with a hole in the roof for the smoke to escape. Their diet was poor, and the gross mishandling of wartime distribution meant that though food was there, many went hungry. Chaos in the rear had been aggravated too by the hundreds of thousands of refugees who had poured back into Russia in the early defeats. A British member of parliament observed their misery. Serried ranks of emaciated, huddled humanity Brutalized by their abject surroundings, corroded by disease, men, women, and children of different races and languages crowded and congested like litters of pigs in an asphyxiating sty. In the towns and factories, too, there was misery. Strikes had been increasing sharply just before 1914. War, with its shortages and inflation, aggravated the unrest. 